It has taken some time, but passively managed funds pegged to indexes have surpassed the assets of actively managed counterparts. This is according to Morningstar reports. Now we're talking about ETFs and mutual funds together. Passive funds have roughly $4.4 in assets by the end of September. And again, this is Morningstar. Actively managed funds slightly less, nearly $4.3 in September. Actively managed U.S. stock funds recorded their eighth straight month of outflows. And Morningstar notes that since March 2014, there's only been two months in which actively managed U.S. stock funds saw inflows. Okay, makes sense of this, <laughs> Deborah. You're the expert. We've been talking about active versus passive, passive for a long time. That trend is still continuing. So I think the challenge is, is that people have learned that it's hard to find active funds that consistently deliver alpha. So if they do it one year, they're not likely to do it the next year or the following year. So on average, seven out of 10 active funds do not beat the S&P 500 if they're a large cap active fund here in the US. And the same is true if you go around the world. I think the other thing that investors have learned is buying lower cost products deliver over a long run better returns for you. So if it's hard to find active funds that consistently deliver alpha, go to an index product like an ETF and get the benchmark and get alpha through asset allocation. So index does not mean passive. You're seeing people use ETFs to overweight countries, sectors, yeah. regions, and generating yeah. alpha through that. So they use a barbell approach to investing. Right, so it's tactical, use of ETFs for tactical trading. Uh, that makes a lot of sense, but that it's still, it's still, you're still using indexes by and large, though, yes. even when you're using it tactically moving in and out. Um, what do you think of uh, the move towards uh, ETFs that don't fully disclose uh, their holdings. Uh, this is going to be a big movement. A lot of people were in active management now. They have a high cost structure, high fee structure in mutual funds. They want to move to the ETF structure. My attitude is that's great, but if you're a lousy e stock picker doing it in a mutual fund wrapper, you're still going to be a lousy stock picture, picker in an ETF wrapper. What's wrong with this story? Well, so I do think the story is is that by moving to the ETF wrapper, and that's a good point, an ETF is a wrapper, right? It's a mutual fund with the added benefits of being listed and traded on exchange, right? So you're right that many active funds don't deliver alpha. Moving to the ETF wrapper makes you more cost efficient because you save on some fund admin and transfer fees, and the in-kind creation redemption in ETFs makes them more tax efficient. So there's going to be some significant benefits from active being inside of the wrapper, but you're right. If you're not a good alpha general generator as an active mutual fund, you're not necessarily going to be a good one as an ETF wrapper. So I think that is part of the challenge. And that's why when the first active ETF came to market with the ticker YYY, the resounding chorus was, why do we need active ETFs? Now, we do see that many asset managers feel they need to have an ETF strategy. And so many are deciding, where yeah. should I offer ETFs? Where does it make yeah. sense? And so they're jumping on the bandwagon. So you, you know all about this. You've got, if you can't pick decent stocks and give good advice to your clients, it right. doesn't matter what the what the wrapper is. It's yeah, it does. It, it, it truly doesn't. I think it's. I think you bring up a great point. Point. It's about fees, and a lot of this stuff is about fees. And how can you get the cheapest execution? And, and if you're going to have a bad stock pick, you might as well not pay on top of it yeah. a boatload of fees. But when you see this push into passive investing, it's about the fees, and it's about people couldn't get into those funds before. Remember when you first started on the street? Yeah. You couldn't get into a lot of these hedge funds. Then everyone owned a hedge fund. And then, yeah. uh, to your point. You only can beat the index for maybe two or three years. Then you underperform because you can't because your longs and your shorts, your, 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 your shorts always underperform and the longs yeah. never outperform enough to yeah. counteract that. Well, wasn't this Jack Bogle's central insight over at Vanguard? His central insight, he wasn't against active management. They had very good people. Wellington that's still there at Vanguard. But his point was these guys have to charge so much that they destroy their alpha by charging those that higher amount. And that's the problem. If you can do active management at a lower cost, then in some cases it's worth it. But even he noted the same thing Steve noted. They don't outperform for very long. Yeah, look, the biggest issue is from when the Mutual funds were growing from 1980 to 1999. The S&P compounded at 18% a year. Last 20 years, it's been 6%. So we've had a third of the return structurally that we had from the early 80s. And that's why you need passive management to not pay those high fees because you can't afford it. Bob, Bob really, really quick, I'll put a bow on it. I, for my children, I have four children. I wind up doing all passive investing, all ETF investing for them because if you're a stock picker, I could pick stocks. But I can't float the boat with my kids trying to pick a granular stock every day of the week. So I choose to buy five or six globally represented ETFs and that's how I invest for my kids.